Hello, everyone. Welcome to Westview Q&A, where we seek to respond to your questions, questions we've received through the week, and questions we didn't get to on Sunday mornings during our time of Q&A. I'm your host, Ryan Simunik, and of course, I'm joined, as always, by Pastor Charlie Salamone. Hello. How you doing, Charlie? Good. Right on. How are you uh, feeling these days, just about the season that we're in as a church? What uh, What are you excited about? Uh... I don't know. Lots of things. <laughs> Lots of things. I have big, big uh, dreams and prayers and expectations, uh, hopes that the Lord is is doing in our midst. So, yeah, you mentioned the backland recently. Yeah, tell us more about that. What's so important about the backland? Why does the leadership team feel so compelled to seek God about it right now? Well, uh, there is uh, uh, an option of of one thing that we could do with part of our backland or the land in front of the church, but there's a lot of other um, questions that we have that are kind of connected to that, and we basically realize the magnitude of potentially making the wrong decision. We want to do what God is telling us to do. And something on our mind is this land has been unused for a long time. And, uh, you know, we realize that this land is very valuable. I mean, it's very financially valuable, but also um, it is it has potential value for the kingdom. And so for me, it starts with a theological biblical belief that God will do whatever we ask for his namesake. Um, Because Jesus said this lots of times. The Bible says this lots of times, if that's our goal. And so having this belief, if we ask God to use this land for his namesake, he's not going to ignore us. That is one of those prayers he said he would always answer. So the reason why I want to gather the church is because I want us together experiencing this ask and receive. Like together, we got together, we pleaded with God, we asked him to work according to his word, we asked him to do the things he said he would do, we asked him to use this land for his glory And then we're going to watch and see him answer. Like, I'm excited about that. I'm excited about about us seeing God answer us in a way where we will collectively be able to say that was definitely God. Like, he did it. That's amazing. And it will be a story that we tell. Amen. Right on. So you touched on this briefly, but what... What do you want from us as Westviewites in this time through this process? Like, what should we be doing? Uh, Well, we have this worship night on Wednesday the 4th at 7 p.m. So this podcast is probably going to launch like two days before that. So hopefully you're hearing it in time. Um, But I think we'll have other similar things. I want us together having a posture of prayer. And not just like, oh yeah, I said my prayer, so I did it. A posture of like expectant waiting prayer as in we prayed we gave it to god we did it together we gathered together we gave it to him and now we're waiting for an answer that we're gonna get because he's faithful that attitude of prayerful um anticipatory expectation like we expect an answer because god is true to his word and he said he would Amen. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, looking forward to stepping into that season so that we can give God the glory when he answers answers our prayers and however way he sees fit. That's exciting. Yeah. You know? Well, we have some great questions today. The first one was actually emailed in. We got our first uh, emailed questions. Actually, I should say we got two. Hopefully, we'll answer the other one soon. Um, For those of you that don't know, Uh, we do have an email address that you can send your questions to, and we would love to hear from you. Yeah. So send us that email address. It is ask at westviewmontreal.org. Okay. That's ask at westviewmontreal.org. Thank you, Charlie. Almost forgot to say it. So send us your emails. So here's the first question. With the recent and not so recent news about Hillsong, 
is it wise to place their music? And by doing so, is it not validating their heretical teachings and sending money to them? I assume there are license fees we pay to them for playing their music. I have the same question regarding Bethel and Elevation music. I have been really loving the hymns that Ryan has been playing when he leads worship. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your ministries. Well, thank you so much for the question. Uh, glad that you've been enjoying the hymns. Yeah. For those of you that don't know, there was recently a documentary that came out about Hillsong Church, and I've only watched part of the documentary. Have you watched it, Charlie? No. No? Okay. Do you Are you familiar with sort of the the details of the scandal or thing that has, oh, things small, that have come out? Small aspects, but I think I can answer the question um, regardless. Okay. Um, yeah, so perfect. one thing I just want to say to anyone listening, I don't know the specifics about Hillsong, and also I'm not super up to date on the teachings of Hillsong. So uh, just to be clear, I am neither confirming nor denying that there's you know heretical things going on at Hillsong uh, Ryan just read the question the way it came in and so um but for the sake of the question let's assume that there is in the sense of let's say you have a worship song and uh the source of the worship song came from uh, a church or an individual who uh, had very bad teaching okay or heretical things so you have a song and the source of the song to use a drastic word is evil let's just say hypothetically that's what's going on is it good to uh, use that song in church well um, I think that to me biblically the concept that comes to mind immediately, and if you've listened to me, you've heard me talk about stuff like this before, is the whole passage in the Bible about um, eating food that was sacrificed to demons. And that, uh, right away people are like, what? <laughs> um, Ryan, you can look up the passage while I'm, uh, I can't remember where it is in the Bible, but I've read it so many times. I think it's in multiple places. Uh, um, in First Corinthians or Romans. But anyways, let me just give you some backdrop of what was going on, and eventually you'll see how it very much connects to this and many other issues that we ask. Um, so at the time, in, uh, outside of Jerusalem especially, outside of the, the Jewish world, if you wanted to buy food, if you wanted to buy meat, uh, the place to get it was from the pagan meat market and the meat that you were buying was of animals that were killed during pagan uh, religious rituals. So the idea is like this is food that had been sacrificed to false gods, to demons. So there was a question among Christians, is it good to be eating this? And... The answer is a little complicated. He says a number of things. But one of the things he says is the whole world belongs to the Lord. And a demon isn't anything. And basically meat is just meat. And all things were created by God to be received with thanksgiving. And we can do all things to the glory of God. Like I can eat a cheeseburger. And it doesn't matter where that cheeseburger came from. I can eat it, and I can thank God for his creation, and I can thank God for his provision um, and for the creation of good food. And so I can enjoy it, even if the meat came from uh, a bad source. And so you can see right there that totally applies here, where if you have a worship song, and the song itself is good, the song itself has good theology, um, like our freedom is is we can take that song and we should we can worship God with it even if it came from you know a pagan meat market in the sense of even if it it was created uh, with bad intentions we can still take it for what it is. I will say that it gets a little more complicated because. 
um, in doing so, it's possible if someone is, uh, you know, let's say there's a church that has really heretical teaching and you have someone who is really involved in that church and they hear us sing that song, they might think that we're affirming that church and that teaching. And that's also brought up in the in the Bible passage about uh, eating food sacrificed to demons in that it says, like, if you're with someone who worships this false god, then you don't want to eat in their presence because you could be subtly giving them the message that you agree with their way of life. So, um, so it's a little more complicated in that sense. But um, to be honest, I don't think... If we sing a song at church, I really don't think that people are necessarily thinking, well, that song came from this, and this church teaches this, therefore this church is affirming everything that this church believes. Like, I don't think that that message really is something we need to worry. I think it's, it's, I think that people who are well-informed people who are well informed about, you know, the false teaching that might be going on in this church or that church. I think those people who are well informed and grieved about that false teaching, I understand how that could make you uncomfortable. And, you know, interestingly, the conversation in the scriptures about food sacrifice to demons also says you don't have to eat it. You don't have to eat it if you don't want to, and no one should look down on one another. Like, if I'm eating it and you're not, neither one of us should look down on one another. So if you don't like that song that Hill's song wrote, and that really disturbs you, you don't have to sing it, okay? You don't have to sing it, um, and I won't look down on you. And in the same breath, you know, like the one, let the one who eats not look down on the one who doesn't and let the one who doesn't not look down on the one who eats in the same breath. Like, don't look down on us if we might sing that song and understand we're not doing it because we love the theology that uh, of the church that it came from. We're just doing it because we're worshiping God. Um, so it's a complicated issue. And I just want to say the Bible is pretty amazing how you can take this old concept like food sacrifice to demons and you can see that like the Bible was, was, it was all written for us and we can translate these old uh, issues into timeless principles. So um, that's the short answer. <laughs> I think that's really helpful. Thank you yeah. for that. No, mm -hmm. I think that's great. I often like to think of, I don't know where this concept originally came from, um, but I heard originally, I think in a Christian rap artist song, but it was basically this idea of God making straight lines with crooked sticks and, and we're all crooked sticks, but especially when we look at circumstances like these, um, maybe it's because I'm looking from the perspective as a musician, but like there are a lot of different people who wrote these songs and, um, we don't know what's in their heart. And even if, like you were saying, it's coming from not a good place, if the song itself is good, like I'd, I also want to make sure that we don't dishonor a good work of the Spirit that he's done despite our sinfulness in general in the church. Yep. You know, um, So there is something to be said for going, but this is, a, this is a good song that the Spirit brought about and making sure that when we see sin in, in one community, we don't write off everything that, that, that has happened because the Lord does work in broken places. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that's good. Is there anything else you want to add to that? No. Okay. But I, I, I like what you said too. I mean, it says in Romans that if you don't follow your convictions, you're sinning, right? It's in Romans 14. Um, so follow your convictions, but let's not be judging each other. Yeah, that's definitely a principle for sure. Yeah, I think that that's really helpful. Thank you. So let's move on to another question now. This is actually from our young adults. So thank you, young adults. Oh, fun. So we know that sin brings suffering in the world. Do we as humans pay a price for the sins of our ancestors? If we do, how is it fair? Or how can we reconcile it with Ezekiel 18.20, which reads, The one who sins is the one who will die. 
The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So just continuing the question now. If we don't, how can we explain that little babies who haven't yet committed sin, although they are born with a sinful nature, die or become very sick, or that in utero babies die before coming out of the womb? Yeah, there's a lot to this question. <laughs> mm. um, where do we begin? Uh, what's the, fir- the first? Let's try to break it down. Uh, yeah, so do we as humans pay a price for the sins of our ancestors? Well, the way that I would answer that is each person in the end, if we're talking about like the final judgment, you know, no one is going to hell for someone else's sin. I don't think anyone will ever be judged, and I think the Ezekiel passage supports this. I don't think anyone will ever be judged for what someone else did. Uh, when it comes to our ancestors, Adam, my understanding is we inherited Adam's sinful nature But I don't see it as we inherited his judicial guilt, if that makes sense. Like, I personally don't believe that a baby who is born and dies, you know, in infancy goes to hell because, you know, they weren't forgiven of Adam's sin or or what. I mean, the way that I see it in the Bible, it's like there is a judgment of works and... I don't think you can fault a baby for doing evil deeds, right? (laughs) Um, However, what we have inherited from our ancestors, namely Adam, is a sinful nature. And I can point to like more immediate ancestors, uh, like of mine, and I could see how like some of the things that my parents did and, and 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 grandparents did I can see how that followed the generations and a part of that is monkey see monkey do you know part of it is that um and there might be more to it there might be something to be said about how our nature is kind of inherited uh you know uh doctors will tell you that the predisposition for addiction and alcoholism runs in the family. Mm. Uh, there is something to be said, I'd say, about how that nature is inherited. But you're not born an alcoholic. You know, like you make choices and eventually you go down that path. And, and, if, and if you end up sinning, those were choices you made. Uh, so that's... That's my understanding is we inherit a nature, but we don't inherit uh, the guilt in the sense of we're punished for what they did. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really helpful. So if I could try and summarize, just correct me if I'm wrong here. So you're saying that we we all experience the effects of sin, that the curse of sin, because we inherit the sinful nature because of Adam, and the earth is fallen. It's there's there's that corruption that's happening. So we all experience that. So death is included in that. Yeah. Um, also, there are natural consequences for our sin that can be perpetually carried on. Things like addiction or sort of bearing. If you have, you know, maybe a a, a dysfunctional parent, with, their sin clearly affects you. Yep. Um, in that sense, but the final judgment after this life has to do with our own personal sin. Yep. And- okay. I, I think in the question, I remember there was there was questions about like people, babies getting sick. Like there is a sense for sure in which the reason why people get sick in the world, the reason why this life is full of pain is because of Adam's sin. Like there's definitely a sense in which that is true and we've all walked in his footsteps. So yes, in that sense, you have little babies who have never sinned, who are experiencing uh, consequences uh, of their, you know, ancestors' sin, and I guess in that way you could say that they're suffering or, or perhaps being punished. But I, I don't think that I would say that it's being punished. Uh, um, I wouldn't use that that phrase. 
Yeah, what would you say to somebody who looks back at their family lineage and sees a lot of dysfunction, a lot of sin, and looks at their own life and and sees a lot of dysfunction and sin and a lot of hurt and sort of goes, is my family just cursed? Am I cursed? Like, what, what would you say to that person? I think any family, anyone could look at their family and uh, see how radical... Um, uh, dysfunction <laughs> is at play. Uh, for some, it's m- more on the external. For some, it's like, oh, it's really obvious how your family has had issues for generations. And for others, it's like on the outside, they look really squeaky clean. But you ask the people and it's like, oh, yeah, there's there's a lot more dysfunction here than meets the eye. Uh, we all have a, a sinful nature and sin wreaks havoc. And... Uh, um, I think anyone could feel that, like, uh, put it this way, sin is at work in, in our flesh, in all of us, and it is, like, we still experience the curse. Christians still experience the curse. Um, it's just a matter of how. Right. How does How does the gospel message speak of the blessing of God in the midst of that. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So it's like if we still experience the pain of the curse, then what about the gospel? Here's an example. Um, So part of the curse was having to work by the sweat of your brow. Okay? Hard toil, right? That's part of the curse. All right, I'm a Christian, and I know a lot of other Christians... And we still have really hard day jobs, you know? It's like I, I love being a pastor sometimes, <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, m- many times I just wish that I could just, uh, I wish that I was just like, could just quit my job and do whatever I wanted, you know? Um, uh, so what I'm saying is like on one hand, we still have this curse of, having to work in the painful, uh, hard labor. But how does the gospel come in? You know, the gospel comes in with, like, messages of, like, uh, rest, spiritual rest in him, Uh, spiritual rest, um, like, in our inner being as we know him and we walk with him and... I could talk about all sorts of passages that speak on this. So now what we have is like this concept where where the blessing comes in in the midst of the curse and like our outward man is wasting away while our inner man is being renewed day by day where we still have to walk in these steps of a life of hardship and 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 sickness and death and such and and there's times that God uh, will help us really obviously in these circumstances. And there's other times where we still have to walk through really hard circumstances. But the difference is with the gospel, he is walking with us. Yeah. And we have this internal rest as God is with us. And we know where this walking eventually leads. And we know that we are getting closer and closer to the curse being gone forever, externally so. Uh, and so we have this... We have this uh, first fruits, this down payment yeah. of, of what we're going to receive in our inheritance because internally we've been set free. Yeah. I, I love the beginning of Ephesians where Paul sort of has this great and joyful like doxology and sort of outlines what Christ has done in the gospel. And he says, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms, because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ, through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. I just think it's so it's so helpful to remind ourselves that even before he created the world, even before the curse happened, God chose us and he and he loved us. And I feel like that's one thing too that really carries us through. Yep. Amen. Right on. Amen. Right on. 
Well, let's go to another question now. This came in on the text number on Sunday, and I just, I love this question. Uh, This is from a seven-year-old, and they ask, how did Jesus forgive our sins when we did not exist? Well, um, you know, sometimes words are used kind of interchangeably, but the words have different nuance. Um, What Jesus did on the cross was he paid for our sins, okay? He provided a way of forgiveness. Um, So in that sense, I might say, like, at the cross, like, God gave us forgiveness. I might say that. Um, And when I say that word in that context, I am speaking of how at the cross, our punishment, what we deserve, was laid upon Jesus. The things that we would do in the future, all all the sin of all humanity was laid upon him. And, and he died and he paid for it. Now, I think the question that you know, you're getting at is how can Jesus forgive us when we weren't born yet is more about um, what... I'm trying to say this in a seven-year-old answer, even though this seven-year-old might not be listening, <laughs> you know, um, as in, you know, this is the best analogy I suppose I can give. Like, uh, you know, if you do something bad and your your big brother or your parent is like mad at you and then, you know, they come to you and they say, you know what? I decided that I'm not mad and I love you and I'm not even going to give you any punishment for what you did. And we're just going to go back to whatever we were doing. and We're going to go to Disneyland or (laughs) whatever. And we're not even going to think about this. Like that's probably the aspect of forgiveness that you're thinking, what I would call relational forgiveness. And I think that happens, um, as we experience him, um, I mean, Ryan read that passage from uh, Ephesians that talks about the concept how we were chosen and predestined for this forgiveness and glory. So there's a sense in which even way back then he knew exactly how this was going to impact us. And I don't think that like God is up there like angry with me, angry, angry, angry. And then I come to Jesus and then he changes his mind. Like that's not how this plays out. Like at the cross, God knew what he was doing. And before time, he had this plan. He always had this plan. Um, For those of us in Christ, I don't believe there was ever a time when God was like actively angry with you. Um, uh, So uh, it was always his plan to to forgive you in Christ. So that's one of those things where I'm going to say it's a longer conversation. But we have to remember that God is outside (laughs) of time as well. Right? Uh, that was above my pay grade. <laughs> yeah. Well, and when and when Jesus died, he paid for the sins of all who would sin in the future, who would who would believe in him. But it was also for sins of the past as well, right? You yeah, talk about Abraham and the faith that he had in God, and it was attributed to him as righteousness, right? But that that righteousness too was was Christ, right? Like that that forgiveness that was extended to those in the past was also because they're putting their faith in God and God looking forward, knowing what he was going to do. Is that correct to say? Yeah, of course. Right on, right on. All right, fam. So unfortunately, due to some technical difficulties, we have to end the podcast here. But if you have a question you'd like us to answer or comment about something we talked about on this episode, please send us an email to ask at westviewmontreal.org. That's ask at westviewmontreal.org. Thanks so much for listening. Grace and peace to you, friends.